Okay, so what does all this have to do with permaculture? Why am I showing you this? Here's the kicker. The reason we're even doing this is so that we can launch ourselves into living a low-key and minimalistic life in the very beginning phases of landing on our piece of property to cultivate faith havens, our personal homestead. Um, I, we do this for clients all over the country. I go through a lot of different efforts in all simple ways and be able to maximize their efficiency and not be held back by little things. Obviously, this isn't an ideal setup. There's a lot more that we could incorporate to make this um, maximum comfort, right? But for us, this is perfect. I mean, look at this. What more could you really ask for? We can live off grid. We can be totally self-sustaining. And we have discovered those little nitpicky tricks that are going to really benefit and bless us in the attempt to get off grid immediately and plug into a completely barren property with no water, no electric, and nothing else on site, we wouldn't have an issue. Now, of course, we're gonna take the steps to make that <laughs> as comfortable as possible, and if we can get water hookups where we're going, then better, um, and electric, right? But we don't have the solar system set up, we don't have the wind power, we don't have hydroelectric, we don't have any geothermal heat, and so like there's lots of things that we could improve on, but these little tricks make a big difference. And when you're coming at it, living a lifestyle as efficiently and effectively as possible with minimal approach, with minimal resources, and not dumping a whole bunch of money into it, whether you have it or not, it's really important to be able to maximize what functions are, are right there in front of you. And if I was just dumping cash into this thing and you know renovating the heck out of it and, and pouring all kinds of funds into it, this would be a one off-grid beast. But it's not gonna be because it's not what we're gonna be li living in long term. And so for us, it's nice to have these little tricks and things that make our life so much simpler. And ultimately, the reason we're on the road is helping other families and getting to their properties and while we're staying in all these rural places trying to teach families how to grow a garden or build a food forest or develop their permaculture faith haven it's difficult for us to function if we don't understand these little loopholes and these little nitpicks and things that we do so the reason this is on this channel is to inspire you to take a deeper look at those little things that you're doing People tell me camper life is gonna be so hard and it's just you're gonna have so much loss of productivity. I feel like we've had more productivity <laughs> than I've had in a long time. I'm catching up with a lot of work and getting really uh, kind of functional on a personal level where we don't have so much baggage since we sold our property. And when we bought this and we paid cash, I'm now debt free. And so we're debt free, we're on the road and we're helping families all over the country. I mean, pfft, is there something better I should be doing, right? And so, you know, my boys, get, we're homeschooled. They learn about the states that we're going to. Their academics are on the road. They understand the different kind of plants and they're learning the ecology little by little, right? Understanding what's edible, what's not. They're kind of just, they're just diving in this creative mode and able to function. Their life skills, social skills have increased. They're around new people all the time. They tell me every day, everywhere we go, oh, I made this many new friends and this is their names. Do you get those kind of conversations with your kids? I do. You know, how cool is that? And so when we go all these new places, my kids aren't afraid to just have this social buzz and jump in and get to know people. And one of the things that homeschoolers are always faced with in their conversation with others is because they're not public school, they don't get the social environment. Well, there's the squash to that. We definitely get social. <laughs> And you know, our neighbors are this particular side are pretty far away, but they could be right here next to us. The last one, uh, it was basically right there. It was right beside us. And they had a great time with them. They were an awesome family. They jumped out and they we all played on the lake together, made some new friends, exchanged contact information. They're good people. Um, but there's lots of other things that, that happen that make this all kind of come together. And so I'm showing you all of these tricks because uh, ultimately how to live off grid is the goal right to not be totally dependent on all the system while we're totally dependent on the parks we're going to ultimately if we wanted to be more independent we could tote around water with us and we could gather it from lakes and ponds and streams and filter it through an epic system under the camper and then we could recycle the gray water through reed beds on a on a site that we want to select to to build such a system um, we could do solar panels across the top and a nice expensive battery bank now we got power and water and i'm not saying that you could be totally self-sufficient living on the road. But once you dock, you can be, absolutely. These little tricks make it so much easier. 
So I'm just trying to inspire you and show you what we're doing. And hopefully uh, you've read past the voice that I have, this uh, congestion. <laughs> we just got a little bit of a bug over the weekend. So all of us have been kind of coughing and, and just congested. So hopefully you can overlook that and kind of catch my point in all of this. Look at these people's homes. There's a, a vineyard right here. And there's just wildflower gardens. Like people get it here. They just get it. Look at that. Oh my goodness. I don't even care if I gotta do a 90 point turn up here. It's worth it. Look at that ground cover. I'm gonna get in there and, and finish up some more details and I'll show you what we're doing for internet on the road and then we'll go from there. Because there's little things that are just little inconveniences that add up and compound to make it really stressful. So let me show you how to overcome those things and what you need to prepare ahead of time. We've been on the road now about five months. We'll be about six months by the time we hit our next destination. It's probably gonna be close to eight or 10 months before we're gonna be done. So we'll full-time camp in this thing for 10 months. And this is the beast we're using. Uh, our first week out, this damage happened here. Good friend helped us move it and he had a big old back bumper, slight jackknife, and it put a big old dent in the side. It's no big deal. It's just something to pay attention to if you're pulling your camper. Now let me show you these tricks. Okay, so trick number one, you gotta have somewhere to store your tools. This made a huge difference for me. I don't only just work on the road, I'm also full-time self-fixer-upper dude. <laughs> so when something breaks or something needs repaired, I gotta have somewhere to put it. I thought that this bay would have been sufficient and some random toolboxes I had just thrown in the back, but they're not weatherproof and it just doesn't do it for me. Um, these here are temporary placements, but that box there is permanent. You gotta have somewhere permanent for your tools. Think ahead there and then one more thing. This is the storage bay. Put all your septic and sewer equipment in a tote that is watertight and I have a rag in the bottom of this for any seepage that I can take out and wash and put back in to make sure that the gray water or the black water isn't staining the bucket itself. It makes it super clean and easy. I got gloves in there, antibacterial spray for the hands and some other knickknacks in there to make it easy. Tools go in nice stowable compartments and then a bin for the miscellaneous and then of course the actual repair kit and should I need to actually do anything to the camper. So that stows everything nice and orderly. On top of what's in my truck, I have the essentials in the camper that need to be in the camper, right? Okay, so now this is the coolest hack ever. I just saw a guy doing this and I was like, oh, no brainer. Why didn't I think of that? Where we're at right now, we don't have any sewer. I just move the tote back and forth as needed. Never occurred to me to leave it hooked up. Check this out. The tote that I purchased was um, engineered and serviced by American workers in the United States. And so I went ahead and did this one from Barker. Super nice, nice solid wheels. Contrary to the Camco tote, which is the first one that I used, this is nice and solid built. Comes with these inflatable wheels so I can replace them as needed. And they're good solid wheels for this gravel. The Camco totes are plastic and they just were not very good. Um, I, as I was using them, I just didn't like them. And the same thing in the front here. But this is the catch all, right? So I hook up my sewer and my black tank and a gray tank. I only do gray water in here. We use the local facilities for black water. But in the meantime, as the gray water is coming in, how would I know that this is full? Well, I have this awesome little float valve and it sits right underneath my window. So all I get to have to do is check that periodically. And when this little red line reaches the top, I know the tote's full. I can come out here, disconnect it, hit the cap, walk it out to my truck, take it to the site and bring it right back, hook it back up, good to go. And so now I have above ground septic tank just chilling out, ready for me. And we went big, this is 42 gallon tank. Um, you could do one smaller. I think I would like one bigger, to be honest with you. But it is what it is, I like this. It's been good for us. That just makes the world of difference. 
some sites, one of the ones we went to had full hookups, everything, but they warned us when we got there, they said that they're high pressure, they run about 98 PSI, 95 PSI, and it can blow out the seals in the camper. And I was like, didn't even think about that. So what I did was I went and I looked at what the other campers were doing and they had these nice, fancy, high dollar pressure regulators on their hose. I just went and got myself a cheap little $20 one from Walmart. And what this does is it keeps it roughly, I think 35, 45 PSI, which is pretty low. I would invest in the adjustable PSI models for like 65, 55 bucks, but this one does great. And then right below that we have the filter, which also was just super cheap from Walmart. I would also invest in getting a better one of these. The water that comes out of these campsites, we've been to, I wouldn't trust it. Where I come from at home base, tap water was full of formaldehyde and just other nasty things. And so we have a Berkey that we use inside and that's just the way that we choose to do it. So I recommend pressure regulator, uh, water filter on top of this epic tote. And then you have your whole system there for your water. The last thing on the water, if you get yourself one of these splits and you're back here messing with your stuff or you just need an extra hose to water the plants or uh, spray off the camper, clean things up, maybe hose something off or you just need to wash your hands, you don't wanna to touch your clean water every time. So you just open up this valve, now it goes to that hose and I've got a spigot on the end, a nozzle that I can use to clean up and do what I need. So super convenient to have access to water and, and not have to plug up your unit here. Simple trick, but makes a big difference. Okay. So one more thing that we're using that has made a big difference for us, our camper was tripping the breakers on 30 amps, 30 amp circuits. So I was like, well, what the heck? It's only got a 30 amp plug. That doesn't make any sense. We went to one of these campsites that uh, electric was not hooked up properly and it started to spark and I was like, what, what's going on? So I went and I checked on my rig. I'm gonna shut the power off on my wife, hold on. <laughs> so <laughs> I went and checked on my rig and what I saw was it had totally melted all of the prongs on this thing. Now, some of you guys have uh, a really nice setup where the cord plugs right into the side of the camper. Well, mine's internal, it goes inside the back of the bumper. Follow the cord here and it runs onto the inside. Problem that I have now is that since this is ruined, this got all fried because of a bad camper hookup, I have to replace this whole thing. It's, or figure out how to chop it and put a new one on. Like it's, a, it's an ordeal. So this no longer works plugging it right in. And because we had a issue right at the plug, what I did was I went ahead and I added an extra layer of protection and I upgraded. Since we were tripping the breaker on 30 amp circuits, I decided to go ahead and get an adapter that has a 50 amp capability. So now with the 50 amp and the 30 amp, and then they've got the regular AC here. And this is your 30 amp. This is the one that fried mine. Not this particular setup here, but the 30 amp. So now I can plug that into my unit and then this one here plugs into there just fine and it works just okay without that burn being a big problem. So now I'm able to run from 50 amps. We don't trip the breaker anymore and we don't have the issues of if it ever sparked again, burning the actual cable that runs into my camper. It would burn just this adapter, which was like 20 bucks is all. And so I get to protect the asset itself. Um, just these little extension things are a lot easier to replace than the whole thing that runs inside the camper and everything else So that's a huge benefit and now that we're at 50 amps I can run my microwave my AC my computer and all the lights and It doesn't trip my internal box in the camper because it, it's built to handle that and It doesn't trip my breaker out here at the panel because it's not a 30 amp I don't know who put a 30 amp plug on my camper, but it sure works really good on a 50 amp <laughs> so uh, That's what we've been using thing to keep an eye out for is when you're setting up your camper chalk the wheels before you unhook it from the truck if you don't when that jack stand is nice and solid down and it's lifting it up it's not enough to, to handle the weight and you can bend that jack that just that little pipe like in a heartbeat it can just snap right off if you're not on a good pitch the one that we're on right now is a perfect example of this it started to roll forward on us and we just have these I would invest in the ones that go between here and stretch out and hold the wheels um, but it, it rolled up on top of this one and this guy is just hanging out it rolled toward the truck and the pipe was uh, not the only thing I had on the ground I had the jack stands down 
And then of course I had my stops. And so we didn't have any problems, but I recognized that had I not done that, I would have bent my pipe or had a bigger problem. So don't do that, keep an eye out for that. Now let me show you my favorite thing about the whole setting up and disconnecting and all of that fun part. Show you this epic part of the journey. <laughs> my hitch has this, so I get to just throw that on there and then I can move this as I please effortlessly. So get yourself one of these. That takes the world of pain out of your setup and disassembly process. It's like my favorite hack. Everything else, my jack stands, my levelers, it's all electric, it's all uh, automatic. And so I just automated my, even my jack itself, which is super cool because I don't have one of those electric, really nice ones that do it with a button, right? That just made a huge difference for me. So I recommend something like that for the sake of convenience. That's all there is to it, really. Just a couple upgrades we've made. I uh, went ahead and changed out the lights on the front. Everything in the camper now is LEDs, uh, minus that one you see in the window. And my beautiful wife in there. <laughs> so these are all LEDs, LEDs, LED. LED so the reason we did that was to con conserve power so when we're boondocking the LEDs pull up a whole lot less and we get the added benefit of them being daylight colored and so that's super nice for us to be able to do as we please indoors and outdoors without having this like yellow just kind of gross lighting you know it, it totally changes the interior of the camper I'll kind of show you what we did there okay so this is the boys rooms We've got four bunks in this beast, and we're not quite to the renovation of this section here yet. We wanna replace all these ugly boards and give them nice uh, thicker mattresses, and then we're gonna put some shelving along the top to give them some more storage space. But so far, this has been one of the best things that, that we've had about this camper is that we have four beds. So all four kids get their very own living quarters. And then I'll show you, there's two options you have. The first one is these bulb replacements that are LED, and then you just throw that in there. And oh man, they're beautiful. Super bright, super convenient, and I don't have to replace this whole unit. And uh, I get a nice white yeah, light in here. It's like a daylight for the kiddos, and I got some on both sides. And then they got some in here too. This is the alternative, is to replace this whole unit. This whole thing here is all one solid replacement. So rather than keeping the old, the old one and just replacing the bulb you can get a whole solid piece you got to pull out your older one snip the wires re dog ear it and then put it all back together and then these LEDs are built in I don't like this one I feel like it was a waste of money to buy all of these when you can just buy the bulbs and they come in a pack of eight so I can do a bunch of them around the house rather than probably the same price I these came with the camper the guy was gonna install these himself and I bought the camper and then did this myself instead. And so, I don't know what these cost, but I bet you they're more expensive than just bulbs. So that's what they look like new, except they're old ones. You just pop the old bulbs out and shablam. Beautiful. And we did the same thing in here, bulbs in there, and that's the way that it works. So right here, the lovely toilet. So what we do here when we pack up the camper and we're ready to go is we drain the gray water and we drain the black water and then when the tanks are empty we plug in the water outside and then I turn on the, the faucets all around the houses for the sinks and then pull, uh, pulls all that sediment out of the gray water and then I have my wife stand here and just push the foot pedal down on the black water to do the same thing. Um, and then once that's all flushed out, we shut everything back off, disconnect the water, we drain that last little bit out of the tanks, they're nice and clean, and then we come back in, <laughs> as clean as can be, uh, then once everything's closed up, we come back in, and we have these sitting by the camper, and we just dump them in. So we do about a gallon in here, about a gallon in there, and we put one of these tabs in here, and then we do half a tab there, and half a tab in the kitchen sink, and then when we're driving on the road, there's a gallon in the gray and a gallon in the black that's full of the sediment uh, dissolvent and slush, right, soap and things, and it's slushing around inside there cleaning up the tank while we're driving. The smell of the tanks and the cleanliness of the tanks, and then when you're dropping the tanks later, um, it just makes a world of, uh, of difference as far as how well it can clean out what's going on, on the inside there. I mean that you do something like that when you hit the road on this thing. 
on your camper, um, and especially before you stow your camper on your property if it's not something you're in long term, because it just makes a big difference on cleaning that thing out. So in our camper, we have a full-size shower. Let me show you what this is real quick. These pampers, they sit there, the flies get in them. Until you're ready to go do a laundromat, it takes a couple days, and by that time, this has been kicked around. To handle that issue, what we do is we use clotheslines outside, and my wife uses this beast. So this thing here drains right through the gray tank. It's full of soap and water, so it actually cleans out the gray tank. And then on the inside, it will wash on one side, and then it will spin dry on this side. And this thing cuts down the cost of laundry bills with our five kids. And then we have a really quick solution to getting our clothes done that day right here on site because we don't have a built-in. The built-in washer-dryer combo is an option. We didn't have it pre-installed. I want it. So we're gonna re we're going to refab this to be able to have that washer dryer. And we'll probably just pull this whole thing out and do our own little cabinet. She handles the interior design, I just build stuff. <laughs> Do it. I'll get it on video. Let's go. What happened? Ah, oh, look at all that love. <laughs> they love you. Good job. Dino, love you, buddy. <laughs> Good job. Awesome, boys. That was a great idea. You thought of that all by yourselves? Awesome, high five. <coughs> Look at the smile on your brother's face. Good job. Proud of you boys. One more cool thing that we did to make our life easier doing this. Uh, a lot of our work is online. So how do you handle no Wi-Fi covered with trees all the time, going from state to state to state, may or may not have cell signal, most of the time don't, and then you go to these campsites that are like nestled into the corner of wherever, and they're just total dead zones, total dead zones. Nine out of 10 places we go, we have terrible service and we can't get any internet. Right, I go do physical things, construction, landscaping, uh, permaculture design, concept designs, consultations, things like that. But how do you handle the online work? That's a huge part of what I do. So we've had this problem. So let me tell you what we did. So oh, we all know that there are cell service providers that uh, offer like hotspots, things like that, or even RV internet suppliers, which is what we're doing, that can function on a remote basis. What's nice about these is that because they work on cell tower services, you can use them as, as you're driving. But alternatively, what happens is if you are boondocking or even in an RV site where there's terrible service, which is what our problem has been. You don't get cell service, so if an internet service is functioning off of cell towers, which is what they do, then you don't get internet either. And so you're paying for nothing. <laughs> so what we did is we went ahead and got ourselves Starlink. Now Starlink is super cool because it runs on satellite. So anywhere that I have view of the sky, which is the whole planet, I get internet. And it's good internet too. I got first day that I hooked it up, I clocked in at 62 megs per second, which is pretty good. Expected to be able to get to between one and 200 once we cross the plains into the Rockies because that's their priority service zone. But on this side of the plains, that's pretty good. 62 megs a second is not bad. This is supposed to go on the roof because we're covered in trees. So let me show you just real quick how this has been a huge benefit for us and I'm gonna throw it up there on the roof right behind me and run it in through the window because I don't have a permanent fixture yet and I'll show you how it works and do a little speed test for you. So now that it's up on the roof here and it'll tilt itself over and then it will scan the sky. You can tell right now it's gonna hit that tree <laughs> and uh, as it's scanning it's gonna say obstructed but I do have a nice center so we'll shoot for that hopefully we've got something good going on and get a good signal and then I'll do that speed test. Just, I'm gonna go ahead and leave my cordage up here because I don't have a permanent solution for this to be fixed on the camper yet. Okay, and the workstation is officially launched. 
Now, I actually have a cool setup here. This is a dual screen laptop, but my boy just threw something at it earlier in the year. Um, really cool laptop called the Asus ZenBook Duo. I double my chair functions as well. So a trick to camper living is function. It's also a backpack and it holds all my fishing equipment uh, in this pocket. I can go post this up by the shoreline and I can go take it down to fish. I can set it outside by the fire pit and as long as it doesn't smell too bad like smoke or anything like that, I bring it on inside here and now it's my desk chair. It's the little things that make all the difference. So here's just some cool things that, that we do to make it easy. I thought I would let everybody know um, how things come together in a functional sense. And then when you're on the road for a longer period of time and you're getting off grid now, or you're living in a camper full time or in a small holding, a tiny house, something like that on your property, now you have some core tricks that will help you increase in efficiency right off the bat as soon as you land on your piece of property and you can start cultivating the land without worrying so much about these little tinky things that get in the way. And as I'm sitting here in front of the work desk, I'm gonna wrap up this video and end it in a way that I can plug it right into the computer and get started on editing. So, just a quick little outro here. Here's my beautiful wife. Um, I just wanted to let you know that uh, you're only limited by what you think you're limited by. Um, our modern world is full of so many incredible things. Technology has just excelled. You live in an age where anything you want to learn, you can learn at the tips of your fingers on a cell phone, the one you're viewing this with maybe. You Knowing this, you're faced with this dilemma. Do I stay stagnant on this plateau or do I grow? Because you have the opportunity to grow every, every single second. Everybody has the same 24 hours in a day. The only difference between you and them, or me and you, is what we do with it in that time. And so I encourage you to overcome these little obstacles. And I just showed you now how we set up our Wi-Fi so we could get internet on the road. And this is may not be your situation, right? This is kind of an oddball video that I'm doing, but the, the little steps that I've taken are just, it's a mindset thing I'm trying to explain to you. Get your mind wrapped around how to make things easier for your life and then do them take action on them, get them put together so that you can function at a higher level and then get to that next level and function better there and function better there and function better there. It's always about growth and, and, and development. So I'm here right now. We're in the middle of a forest in eastern Tennessee and I'm surrounded by trees and no, barely any service on my cell phone, but I'm going to do a speed test here and I'll show you what's going on with our Wi-Fi. All right, let's find out. I loaded all those ads pretty good. Covered in trees. We're getting about 16. I mean, it could be, it could be better. Oh yeah, the upload's not bad. Upload at 14, 13. Well, it's going down. Oh, it's, we're losing it. Oh, about 10. All right. So you see, it's not that bad. Um, overall, I think that what we've been able to achieve is pretty cool. So if you chime in and you follow us along, you'll see some more of the things that we're doing. And then, of course, because I have epic Wi-Fi, I'm going to start this recommended update in the middle of the forest. <laughs>